Our scripture reading comes from the book of Esther. I'll get there eventually. Esther chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. Esther 4, 13 and 14. And Mordecai told them to answer Esther, Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. This time, Pastor Evan will have our message. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Um, let's uh, take a moment and ask the Lord for his blessing upon the message here, and so that he uh, assists me. Uh, dear Father in heaven, Thank you so much for everything you've done um, in giving us your word. And uh, please give me the words to speak. Um, I, I need your help to be able to uh, share everything today. And I need, uh, I need your words to be in my mouth. And I ask that you give everyone uh, ears to hear, eyes to see and uh, anything that you want them to hear in this message. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, in the book of Esther, chapter 4, uh, it picks up in the story of a lady named Esther who actually ended up becoming uh, one of the king's concubines of Persia, and she was highly favored by king, uh, the king of Persia. So while I turn here to uh, Esther chapter 4, get this. Esther comes right before Job, if you're wondering where it is. So Esther chapter 4 is, here's where the story picks up. There's a man named Haman, and he is working amidst the councils in the kingdom with the king of Persia. And there's a man he doesn't like named Mordecai. And Haman is doing um, all he can to get Mordecai killed and all of Mordecai's people, who are the Jews. So they come to a point where the king puts a decree in place that Mordecai and all the Jews in the land should be killed on an appointed day. So here's Mordecai's response. Mordecai in chapter 4, he hears that everybody's going to die. And he says, I need to do something about this. So what he does is he he starts, he mourns, he's in sackcloth, ashes, and all the Jews are in great distress because of what is about to happen to them. There's actually a decree going out that they're going to be killed. So, um, in verse 4 it says, Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her, and the queen was deeply distressed. So, Esther says, you know, Mordecai, you don't need to do this, um, you know, I have um, better clothes for you. You don't, need, you don't need to do all that. And then Mordecai refused to put the, uh, the better clothes on because he, he saw what was about to happen. And so he has this conversation with Esther, and here's what he says. Um, I'll read you part of this conversation here. Uh, with Esther speaking to Hatak also. So this is Esther 4, verse 10. 
Then Esther spoke to Hathak and gave him a command for Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's province know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king who hasn't been called, he has but one law, put all to death except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter, that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to go into the king these 30 days. So they told Mordecai Esther's words. See, Mordecai had said, Esther, you need to, to speak the king, to the king about this. And she says, well, I'll die if I go in there. Uh, I can't go in unless the king calls me in. And then Mordecai answers this in verse 13. Don't think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And then here's what Esther said. Go, gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan. Fast for me. Don't eat or drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise. And so I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way, did according to all that Esther commanded him. Well, this is an inspiring story here. You have Esther, who has probably a pretty comfortable life in the king's court. She has all the food she needs. She has uh, nice clothes. She's uh, got maids that listen to her. You know, even though she was taken as a captive, her life was probably pretty decent being in, in the royal court there. And her people come to a place where they're all going to be killed. And there's the possibility that she might escape because she's in the king's court. But Mordecai reminds her, says, no, not even you will be able to escape this. Not even you, Esther. And... Taking this into consideration, I don't think she had selfish motives, but she took into consideration what was about to happen. And she made the decision and said, okay, we're at a point of crisis. I'm going to fast. I'm going to pray. And I want you all to do the same because we need the Lord's help. And then Mordecai went and, and did all that, that she asked. And there come times in our lives that are points of crisis, times when we have to make big decisions, and those are the times that it's appropriate to fast and pray if you're seeking the Lord's guidance, if you're seeking some type of path for yourself that the Lord has for you, it's time to fast and pray when you have a big decision. Whether it's a crisis or even something good, fast and pray, and that's a good way to open up the, your, your senses so that you can hear the Lord's voice. And even in our world today, we have uh, an interesting time. We have the virus. And I've mentioned, too, you know, we have protests, riots, and we just have this state of unrest and uneasiness in society. If you find yourself concerned, if you find, find that um, you're having an inner groaning within yourself for what might be coming upon the earth, take some time to fast and pray so that you can have peace with the Lord and assurance of what your calling is in such a time as this. 
Because the truth is, is that, you know, everybody has a place in God's work in this time that we're living in. Um, in Esther's day, she was placed in the king's court to make special intercession for God's people and change the whole course of a nation of people through her actions. And she only did it because of her dependence upon the Lord. She didn't go and try to make a bunch of policies to try to change all this stuff without the Lord's help. She went to the Lord first before she took a step in that, that bold direction of going into the king's court. Remember, she would die if she went into the king's court unannounced. So she went to the Lord first before making this critical decision, and then she went in in faith for the good of her people. She went in in love. And, you know, the decisions that you have to make in life should be done in love like they were by Esther too. And whatever it is, you can be sure that the Lord wants to help you. He's helped his people all throughout history. And what, there's an interesting thing about the book of Esther is that, you know, God is never actually uh, mentioned in the book, but you can see that he's working all throughout the whole book of Esther. I mean, <laughs> the prayer is answered and the Jews are saved. You can see God working in the background through making sure everything works out just, just, just right. And so, we're living in a time when um, maybe you're not seeing exactly what the Lord's doing. Maybe you're not seeing exactly what He's doing in your life. But be faithful. Be faithful and look for His providences and look for the blessings that there are. Because as you look for those blessings and as you step forward in faith and love, things are going to work out for you. Just do what you know the Lord has told you to do at this point in time. Be faithful to that, and you'll get more light as, uh, as you progress through life. And, you know, later on, everything ends up working out fine for Esther. You know, she, she lives, the Jews live, Haman gets hanged. Um, God makes sure the enemies are taken care of. And so it's going to be that same way for you, too, in such a time as this. And speaking of the time that we're living in today, um, I started, this is related, I'll talk about our time. So I've been doing some investigation in Revelation uh, about, you know, the meaning of different symbols and events and all these things. And I, I decided to take a look at... Uh, the third seal in Revelation 6. And I'll, I'll read it for you here. It says, Revelation 6, verse 5, When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius. And do not harm the oil and the wine. Uh, in the past, this has been understood that uh, this was an age of the church. And this takes place during the time from Constantine to Justinian. And those are the, the early 300s to the year 538 is the time of the third seal. So that's around the time of Constantine to Justinian. That's the time period in Roman history when church and state really began to get closer together. Uh, you have Constantine really stepping out, making the first law of uh, worship in the empire. He began to mix pagan and Christian worship in order to draw pagans in. Um, and he made, there was many compromises in the church at large just to get 
uh, people to join the church. And so this is the, the time when uh, the church was dark. It was a black horse, and he who sat in it had a pair of scales in his hand. So the, the black horse here represents a time of, of, a, uh, of not being able to see, a time of darkness and deep error in the church. What were some of these errors in the church that came about in this time? Well, the time of, Const of Constantine to Justinian from the 300s to about 538 is the time when some of these things got really popular. There was purgatory began to uh, be taught. Uh, there was worship of saints. Um, there was the celibacy of priests. And there were other errors and falsehoods and deceptions that became prominent in the church at that time. And uh, what else was going on here was um, you have this, this, excuse me here, you have the black horse and the one sitting on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I looked up the word for scales. Uh, the scales are uh, another way of saying it, it's a yoke or a crossbar. It's related to the word that Christ uses when he says, take my yoke upon you. Um, and I'm still trying to figure out what bearing that has on interpreting this. But uh, I did study the uh, book of Daniel and Revelation by Uriah Smith, and here's a few things he says about it. He says, uh, the scales in this uh, one's hand on the black horse represent the civil and religious power beginning to work together. And he says that uh, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius represent that uh, people were seeking continually after money, and that was the, uh, the most important thing in people's lives at that point. I'm still trying to get where he gets that from exactly, but I, I have it in my mind to, to keep it for understanding. In my commentary here, here's what it says about it. It says, okay, a quart of wheat is about the amount of wheat a person eats in a day, about the amount of grain a person eats in a day. A denarius was a day's wages. So what you have here is people spending their whole earning for the day for all of their food for the day. That indicates uh, poor economic conditions, and it indicates, uh, it indicates, yeah, that's not a good time if people are uh, spending all their daily wage just for food. And it also says here, don't harm the oil and the wine. Uriah Smith says that represents the graces, uh, the Christian graces like faith and love. And the command is to not hurt those. So the Spirit of God is still working in his people at that point in, in the church's history. So that's some of the historical interpretation of it. You have, you know, the black horse representing the church in darkness and error, false doctrines. You have church and state beginning to work together as the church goes deeper into error. You have poor economic conditions. And you have God still preserving the oil and the wine during that time. And so I decided I'm going to look up what Ellen White has to say about these seals. And here's something I found. Um, so here's, here's this, is, this is interesting too. The book with the seals. Have you guys ever, do you know what the book with the seals has in it? Has anyone ever looked into what, what all is in that book? I mean, it's obviously the things written in the seals, but here's what Ellen White understood it as. She says, this book that the lamb is worthy to op open, only the lamb was worthy to open it. And John cried because no one was worthy to open it. The book has the history of God's providences. 
It has the prophetic history of nations and the church. This book that with the seven seals, it has divine utterances, divine authority, commandments, laws, the whole symbolic counsel of the eternal. The history of rulers of nations. It has everything from beginning to end in that book. And uh, that book is the book that Jesus is worthy to open. No one can handle that amount of knowledge and truth except Jesus. Well, and the Father, of course. Um, and here's what Ellen White had to say about the third seal written in that book with so many things. Um, in a letter to Griggs and Howe, in August 23rd, 1898, she says, the same spirit seen today, or this, we see the same spirit today that's seen in Revelation 6, verses 6 to 8. The same spirit. And honestly, I'm still trying to figure out totally what that spirit is that's discerned, or that, that's presented in Revelation 6, 6 to 8. Uh, it could be the spirit of worldliness in the church and, and darkness and deep error. Um, and the spirit of uh, grasping for money, that kind of thing. And that would actually make sense because we're living in the day when there's a few false doctrines that are prominently taught in the Christian church. One is the sacredness of Sunday. Uh, another is that you live, you continue living when you die, that you have an eternal soul. And uh, those are two prominent false doctrines that have a, I mean, that are largely taught in the Christian church today. And you also have uh, well worship of, saints and of course in the Catholic Church and that kind of thing. But uh, as Protestantism unites more with the world, it'll drift farther, further and further into darkness. And what happened, here's what I see the bearing of it is. Um, in the past when church and state came together, first the church had to go into falsehood and deception and darkness and error. And because the church became dark like that black horse, because it went into the darkness of error, it sought to join with the civil power because it didn't have the power of God anymore. And that's how church and state will come together in the United States. Um, as Christianity at large becomes more and more void of the Spirit of God, it will get closer and closer to the rulers of the earth. And um, we can see that progression today already. And here's what Ellen White says. She says, right after she says, the same Spirit that's seen, uh, that we see today that's represented in Revelation 6, 6 to 8, so that's error, deception, um, false doctrines, church and state working together. She says, we see the same spirit today. She says, history is to be repeated. That which has been will be again. And right after that is the fourth seal, and that's when church and state have fully come together, and then persecution begins by the church-state power. You know, it's, it's this pale horse, um, death in Hades, followed with them. It's horrible. And we're living in that day. We're living um, in a sense in the time of the third seal. Uh, the time when church and state are, are coming closer together. And it will culminate in a time like Esther came to. Um, Esther 
was living at a point in history when a decree was put forth to kill God's people, and we know that church and state will do this in the future. And uh, we need God's courage, we need God's boldness, and we need to be willing, like Esther, to make tough decisions in that time and be willing to say, if I perish, I perish. I'm going to do what God wants me to do. Because we know that when the uh, mark of the beast is enforced, we'll be forced with a decision like Esther. You know, do I st hang out here in the courts of the king and, and try to ride this out? See, maybe, I, maybe I'll live, you know? Maybe I'll make it. Um, or do we stick with the people of God and do what God has called us to do? Because we have been called for such a time as this. Uh, each one of us to play our own special part in God's final work on this earth. You may have work like Esther. You may be like Mordecai out of the courts, making the request to Esther and notifying her of what needs to be done. You may be uh, one of the Jews out there mourning, seeing what's about to happen, and fasting and praying. But we all have a part. We all have a part in God's final work. And it's not only to ask for God's help out of the crisis. This, before we reach that crisis when the death decree goes out, we have a work to do for the Lord. And that work is to reveal our precious Savior to people. That's our work on this earth. Do you have questions about what God wants you to do? Here's what it is. Show people what Jesus is like. And then they can stand with us during that crisis without hesitation, with boldness, saying, if I perish, I perish. I'm going to stick with Jesus, the one who died on the cross for me, the one who laid down his life the one who gave me this word to point me to heaven, to him. We've been called for such a time as this, brothers and sisters. And we don't have to be afraid. We can be joyous in the Lord and give ourselves wholly to the work of God. We can do it. And it's not really us anyway. It's God. Not really us. And uh, I want to encourage you today to be strong. And remember that phrase saying, if I perish, I perish. I'll do anything for God in the point of crisis. This could even be a point of crisis, not with the, the national crisis and church and state coming together, it could be a point of personal crisis. When you're being compelled by the devil to do something to find your own way out of trouble. But stick with God and make him your strength. Fast and pray and stay with the Lord. And I want to ask you today, are you prepared to say, if I perish, I perish, I'm with the Lord? You ready to say that? Amen. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much for uh, raising up people in past generations uh, so we can hear their stories. And uh, we ask that you give us strength in the times ahead and give us courage and uh, let us uplift your son and the glories of the cross. In Jesus' name, amen.